Good morning, everybody. Isn't it a beautiful day? There is a promise of a beautiful day. As the uh, clouds burn off, as they did yesterday, it's going to be the repeat of yesterday. So we will be blessed by a nice sunny afternoon. A um, few announcements today. Uh, welcome to Gladstone Park, though, first. Welcome here, and those of you who are watching online, welcome as well. We, uh, we ask that you just enjoy this day that we spend with Jesus. All right, I have a few announcements here, uh, more than a few, evidently. Um, there's a uh, ultimate mission. F those of you who are aware of ultimate mission, it's, it's a mission from one of our elders in our church. Ultimate mission, they, uh, they sponsor um, women missionaries and healthcare workers in India, the Philippines, and one other country, and I can't remember right off the top of my head. They're gonna have a fundraiser at uh, Look In Your Bulletin. It'll be at Bob and Connie's house um, July 18th. So be aware of that. Uh, let's see, we got a bunch of things. Oh, we got some really good news. We got two people today that are having birthdays. Jolene Dunn, who is right back there. Raise your hand, Jolene. Say, remember to say happy birthday to Jolene. And is Tanya Erickson here today? No? I'll have to call her. I'll have to call her. All right. Um, so uh, let's see. I, I'm, I needed to do that. That's one of my favorite things to do, embarrass people for, for their birthday. Okay. Um, there's a, a slide in the announcements, I believe. Evidently not. So uh, this time of year, we usually have over at the conference grounds, those of you who are aware of it, is camp meeting. And for the last two years, because of um, COVID, we have not had a camp meeting physically at the campground. And this year, oh, there it is, maybe. She's doing it stealthy. Um, this year, we're being um, a little more proactive, a little more fellowship. We're going to ease into camp meeting. Next year, we'll have a real camp meeting, and you can all come. But this year, we're spreading it around with different churches, and our church is one of those churches. So we are going to be live streaming the evening meeting at 7 o'clock. And at 5.30, we're going to have a light supper for whoever wants to come at 5.30. So come yourselves and bring friends, bring family, bring anybody you like. We're going to have a light supper at 5.30. And then we will be streaming uh, John Bradshaw uh, evening meeting at 7 o'clock. And also happening at the same time as we're going to have a children's program. So be aware that there's a children's program, a full children's program that's going to go along, along with that. So invite your friends, invite your family, and, and do that. It, it should be really fun. Uh, one other thing, and it didn't get in the bulletin, so I'm going to have to tell you now, and you'll have to make a note in your bulletin, those of you who come, all the men of the church and anybody else are invited to breakfast tomorrow morning. So you can come at 7 and fellowship and enjoy uh, putting the breakfast together at 7 o'clock, and we serve breakfast at 8 o'clock, and that'll be in the fellowship center. So come for that. I also want to give you a heads up because everybody's schedule is very busy this year and has always been busy. And we're going to have a little program called Dash Through the Dahlias. Dash Through the Dahlias is a visit to a big dahlia farm. I believe it's the one in Canby. And that'll be on August 14th, right after church, right after, I hope we're having potluck by then. Right after potluck, we'll be going to a dahlia farm in Canby I believe that's where it is, and, and that's a beautiful place. I've been there a number of times. They have other th activities there usually too, so remember that. All right, also this month, um, our church tries to be active, so we're going to have a community impact day on July 18th, and usually what we do is we meet here at the church at nine o'clock. I don't know quite what we're gonna do, but 
uh, we're going to go out in the community and help somebody. That's what it's all about, is helping people. So on July 18th, be here at 9 o'clock. Uh, there'll be a little, bit, uh, a little bit more information coming on that next week. And, and we'll go out and help in the community. That's the whole idea of that. So um, let's see, what else do we have here? What else do we have here? Oh, leadership team, which would normally be this Monday, uh, is going to move to July 12th. So that's that. All right. Uh oh. What's this about? What's going on around here? This is something I wasn't expecting. Other side. <laughs> oh, he's found something. He's found something. Let's see what he's found. Mm. Let's see what this is. Let's see what this is. Oh, it's a poster. It's a poster. It says, it says Jasper Canyon Vacation Bible School. So you're going to be there, I assume. <laughs> All right. And, and Jasper Canyon. Hmm. Gladstone Park Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church, August 2nd through the 6th, 9.30 to 12.30. Right? Right? And you're going to be there. All right. Well, thanks for bringing this to my attention. I, I, oh, he wants me to invite kids to come. All right. So, so I see a lot of kids here. So we have almost half, uh, well, not half. We're, we're planning on having 80 to 100 kids here. So, so come. Register and come. Right? Thank you. I guess we're going to have vacation Bible school with a dog in it. So remember to come to, and remember to bring, um, bring your kids to vacation Bible school. This, this promises to be a really good program. Um, this is uh, designed by the North American Division. So, so come and enjoy that. And with that, it's time to start our worship service. Pardon? Okay. Um, I, I was going to do that in prayer, but I will do it now. Uh, we all know Vanina McLean, her sister, who happens to be uh, 95. Her name is Jean. Uh, she fell and has broken her hip. So. Keep Vanita and her family, and especially Jean, in prayer. Uh, prayer works. Prayer works. So keep them in your, in your prayers as well. So, and with that, we will do our call to worship. And I always like it when I can hear you speaking at the same time I am. So let's begin. This is First Chronicles 16, 28 through 29. Give to the Lord, O family of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. All right. So church family, those of you who can kneel, would you kneel with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you that you are looking out for us. You are waiting for us to ask for your help. You're waiting for us to come to you and praise you. And we take time out now to praise you for all that you do. Father, we, we are celebrating Independence Day of our country today. But Father, it, as we look at the bulletin, we see the eagle, the mighty eagle, the symbol of freedom in our country. Father, help us to remember the symbol of our personal freedom in you. Help us to remember Jesus, 
and him crucified and the cross on Calvary that brings us all freedom. It brings us all freedom. Father, we're free to communicate with you. We're free to be in your presence. We're free because of what Jesus does. Father, we ask that 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 be in our hearts always and brought close to us so that we can remember all that you've done, the plan that you had for us from the beginning of the world was completed in Jesus, and we need to keep him in our hearts and our minds always. So, Father, help us do that. Again, I'd like to mention uh, Vanita's cousin, Jean, uh, Rich Love, um, Irene Trude, and Father... We also want to lift up Pastor Nate and his family who are still grieving the loss of Mary. Father, we, there are so many other people that are hurting and having problems, and you know who they are, and you know the solution. So, Father, give strength to Pastor Nate today, and may his message be from your lips to our ears. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want you to do something for me this morning. Can you all smile? <laughs> oh, how nice it is to see those smiles. I have missed those. It's, uh, you know, you almost forget what people look like when they're covered in a mask all the time. What a blessing it is to see your faces this morning. I just want to thank you all for uh, your faithful giving to our church budget. We came this close to meeting budget, and that is wonderful. Thank you for that. You know, we talk about um, the need to keep the physical building going, and uh, which is all important, but we have so many ministries in our, our church that... Um, they reach out to others in the community. They reach inward and um, encourage and fill us so that we can go out and touch other people. And that's why we're here. We're here not to just um, come and sit and listen to a message, which is important, but we are supposed to learn, be fed, and then take that message out into the world. That's what God wants us to do. And our church budget helps us to do that by supporting all the ministries that we have. So please continue to be faithful in giving to our church budget. And I just also want to remind you about the fellowship hall that we have this um, this match uh, that somebody has uh, donated, they will match whatever we give. Is it through September or to September? September 1, September 1 okay. So give prayerful thought to that so that we can have the fellowship hall completely paid for. And what a blessing it is for this person who is willing to give so so graciously, Lord. And now why don't we go ahead and bow our heads, but I guess I need to also remind you that we have um, the boxes here for the children's uh, ministries and also for tithes and offerings. There is another set out in the foyer if you go out that way today. So again, let's go ahead and bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we... We are so blessed by your gift of love. 
your gift of salvation, Lord. And I just pray that we can take that to heart and think about how much you have given us, Lord. And then help us to be willing to give in return in our tithes and our offerings, Lord. Help us to remember that you are ever with us. You are ever with each ministry that we have in this church. And we ask, Lord, that you would guide those ministries. They are yours. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, now is the time for the children's no. story. No. Nope. Going to sing you. first. Going to do something. Okay. <laughs> because I figured if I got done with the children's story, I might have trouble doing my part. So anyway, so if you want to look at your hymnals on page 526, you can see, you can read the words there. Thank you.
Thank you, Dean. Now it is time for the children's story, and Dean will be doing that as well, so I'm, I'm guessing it might be a little related. <laughs> might be a little related? Well, I don't know. This might be a fishy, might be a fishy story. A fishy story. <laughs> All right. Hey, kids. So anybody, any, any of the kids that are here come today, on. come and spread yourself come out on. up here. And come up here. Come in for this children's story. Okay, usually when I start out with doing a children's story, beings, it is a children's story. You tell the adults, they can't listen. How is that going to happen? Anyway, okay, uh, I have a special family here today and a very favorite place that we can't go to anymore. That's where I met them. And uh, I was sitting at my usual table and this family come in and sat down behind me. And they asked, who wants to say the blessing? There was only two girls at that time. And so, I will. And so I was very quiet and stopped eating. And I was listening. And pretty soon my ear starts getting longer. Or my neck was getting longer and longer. And I was listening. I think she put some of the adults to shame. Because sometimes when we adults thank God for the food, we say, Dear Jesus, thank you for this food. Bless us. Amen. This girl not only thanked the food, but she prayed other things too. So I asked, I got up and I said, Man, that was a beautiful prayer. And she got the biggest smile on her face. And I says, How old are you? And she goes, Wow, five years old. Anyway, okay, now on with my story. Hope I didn't embarrass them too much. But anyway, uh, this story is about a man. I'm going to be moving back and forth and around because i got to move. Otherwise, I'd probably get too nervous and, and I forgot what I was going to say. I might even do that anyway or might add other thing. But anyway, this man lived in a country somewhere probably far away. And it was in the valley that was called the Valley of the Moons. Of course, we know there's only one moon. But it must have reflected off the hillsides. But this fella must have been really happy the way people look at things. Because he had one, two, three, four, five. No, wait a minute. No, no, it was only, only, only four. He had four wives. Now, I don't know how many kids there might have been involved, but we'll find out later that there was one. Uh, and I don't know in this family if, if the other wives or her moms or whatever could tell the other kids what to do or not. But anyway, the reason he wasn't very happy at all because wife number one, the one that he loved the best, became a Christian, and she loved Jesus. And she kept saying, husband, I wish you would love my Jesus. He says, oh, be quiet. I don't want to hear about him. He says, but I can pray to him. I can talk to him. He can talk to me. But he says, you don't even know where he's at. Because sometimes when you pray, you look down. Is he under the house? Sometimes when you pray, is he up on the roof? But my God is good and kind, and he listens. He says, oh, be quiet. I don't want to hear about that. Well, one time, he decided he wanted something special for supper. How many like corn? Do you like corn? Do you like corn? Corn on the cob? Yeah, I like corn on the cob. Well, apparently, he wanted corn on the cob. But... It wasn't the time of the season, or maybe it was just almost over. So corn was kind of hard to get. He said, if your God is so big and so kind and so good to you, you ask him for corn. And she said, well, okay. I don't know. I know he listens. 
but can he give us corn? And so she prayed, dear Jesus, my husband wants corn, and I don't know where there is corn. If you can find some place where I can get corn, please help me. So she thought, and she prayed, and she prayed. Well, we don't know exactly what she did, but she was able to trade and do this and that. And guess what her husband had for supper? It was corn. And he said, oh, you probably just got that anyway, because I don't believe he gave that to you. She says, but my God is so good. Oh, be quiet. I don't want to hear about that. Another time, their baby got really sick. Have any of you ever been really sick? Maybe. And they didn't know what to do. He prayed to an idol that was on the corner on a table. And that idol didn't listen to him. And so they even took him to the doctor. Doctor couldn't help either. So the husband said, wife, if your God is so big and so kind and so good, why don't you just ask him to make our baby well? Oh, he can give us corn. But I've never heard him making anybody, anybody well or not. So I don't know if he can do this or not. So she says, okay, I will. I will be praying to my big, wonderful God and see what he can do. So she prayed, dear Jesus, I don't know if you can do this or not. Giving us corn might have been easy. But making somebody's baby well, I've never heard of that before. But maybe, just maybe, maybe if you would make him well, maybe, maybe my husband would love you too. Well, she prayed and prayed. And guess what? The baby got well. And I said, ah, he probably would have gotten well by himself anyway. She said, but husband, my God is really good and kind. Okay, here's where it gets a little bit tricky, maybe a little bit ornery. I don't know how many of your mommies would like it if their husband or your daddy says, wife, I'm going to go on vacation. I'm going to go two weeks to my brother by myself. Uh, I don't know. Wives might not like that. Well, I guess maybe she didn't have any choice. But he said to her, wife, here's my key. I want you to keep it safe. And don't let any of my other wives go into my room. So she says, okay, husband, I will hide your key under your God. That's where it will be when you come home. So, okay. So the next morning he got his backpack ready and food and stuff, and he started off on his journey. He was walking and walking and walking and walking and walking and walking. Oh, so, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to sneak back into the house. I'm going to get that key. I'm going to put it in my pocket. <laughs> that great big God of hers is not going to put his hand in my pocket and get that key out of there. He just can't. So off he went. He went back in and got the key. And he says, now, when she comes back in, she's going to see that the key is gone. And she's going to pray and pray and pray. And she's going to look and look and look. But she's not going to find it. And he's not going to get it out of my pocket. <laughs> so he went on his way. After a long time, he was getting tired and a little bit hungry. So he stopped, sat down by this stream or a creek, whatever you want to call it, maybe depending on part of the country you're from. So he sat there and got a drink, ate his lunch, and then he got to think, oh, oh no, what, what if I lose the key? I'm gonna have to tell her, I come back and got the key, because I was wanting to play a trick on you. So he takes this big leaf, I don't know, maybe it was a banana leaf, I don't know. But anyway, he wraps the key up, nice and tight, and he digs the hole down by the tree, puts it in there and covers it up. Goes on to his brother. They had a good time visiting and playing and working, but it's time to come back, so he 
walked and walked and walked and walked, come to the stream, took a drink, sat down by the tree, started digging in the dirt. What? Where is it? I, I know it was, it was right here because I specially looked at the tree and, and the key was gone. No, now I will have to go tell my wife what I did. So anyway, he gets ready and he walks on home. He walks into the house and he says, wife, where is my key? She said, husband, when you left, you saw me put the key under your idol on the table there. She walks over, picks up the idol, says, here it is. He says, what? No, uh-uh, you can't have, no, no way, no, you couldn't have gotten the key. There's just no way, because when you left, when I left, you were in the garden, I snuck back in and got that key and put it in my pocket. Well, while he was at his brother's, a big, heavy rainstorm came and flooded that leaf and the key down the stream and away. She says, I knew you were coming home today, so I went to the market and I looked and looked and looked and I found the nicest, bestest looking fish I could find. Well, when I was cleaning it all up nice, I felt something really hard and strange in its tummy. And when I opened it up, there was the key. See, I told you I have a great, big, wonderful God. He gave me the key back. Husband, I wish with all my heart that you would love my Jesus too. Well, after getting the corn, making the baby well, finding the key again, he says, wife, yes, I do. I do want to learn to love your Jesus too. Okay, thank you, kids. You may go back. Good morning, everybody. Dean, thank you for that story. That was great. You know, as a, as a pastor, as a preacher, I, I always try to, to do well when it comes to preaching time, but I never thought that I would have to try to top a dog uh, in the church service. So I think we'll be seeing more of him. I'm not sure, but I think so. Um, as we get started, I just want to... First of all, thank you all, my church family, for your kindness, your support, your words of, of comfort, your prayers um, during this time while um, my family is grieving the loss of my mom, Mary, who lived with us. And um, we're still on that journey of grief. It's, it's hard. Many of you have normalized the grief experience for us and let us know uh, your own experiences and, and just the, the reality of grief. Um, but we're so grateful to, to be in this church, to be church family with you. And the cards, the meals, the encouragement have all been greatly appreciated and have blessed us more than I can express. So thank you so much for that. Um, as we get started, I want to um, offer a couple of gifts. And what I usually do is... Um, have a young boy or girl and also an adult um, answer a, a question. Um, sometimes it has to do with our mission statement. Um, but today, I noticed that we have a lot of guests here today, and so I want to give a gift uh, to our guests today. I have one for an adult. It's a Truthlink Bible study set. It's a fantastic set. And I'm wondering, if you're a guest here today for the first time, would you raise your hand? Somebody's pointing for you. Yeah. Thank you. What's your name? Abby. Abby, Abby welcome, and thank you. Judah, would you take this to, to Abby and her family to enjoy? Thank you so much. Um, also, I have a, a little book for a young boy or girl who is here for the first time. Do we have any boys or girls who are here for the first time ever? 
I know we've got a, a row over here. I do want to spread it out, though. I see a, a young man back there. What's your name? Eli. Eli, welcome to you and your family. Judah, would you take this to Eli and greet him? Thank you so much. Boys and girls, we do have prizes, though, that we give out at the end of our church service. And today I'm going to be preaching about freedom. So as many times as you can hear me say the word freedom or free, you want to tally that. And uh, Josie, I believe, is doing the count today. Yes, thank you, Josie. And after that, you're going to meet Josie over by the Fellowship Center and just let her know how many times Pastor Nate has said the word free or freedom starting now. So zero, but starting now. And um, you will get a prize over there as you meet up with, what's the word? <laughs> free or freedom. So that's two. There you go. All right. As we get started, would you bow your heads with me as we have another word of prayer? Our Lord in heaven, I thank you so much that you are the one to whom we run to and rely upon. You are our strength. You are the creator. And you are our redeemer. We thank you this morning especially for the gift of salvation, which you've given to us freely in Jesus. And we receive that gift anew this morning. Thank you for your amazing grace and thank you that you promise to be with us as we gather. Lord, uh, you are an all-powerful God, and I am just one man. And so I pray that you would use me, this vessel, to speak words of encouragement. And that you would lead us this morning closer to you. And that we would leave here with a, a new resolve to walk with you day by day. We love you and praise you. And we give you all the glory, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this weekend, of course, is uh, Independence Day weekend. And uh, many of us throughout the United States are celebrating our nation's independence and our freedom. It's a day in which we commonly gather together with friends and family, and we have barbecues and celebrations or watch parades or, uh, of course, blow up fireworks, right? How many of you enjoy fireworks? Yeah, how many of you do not enjoy fireworks? All right, just keeping it real. I learned something about Wally today, yeah. Okay, well, I grew up in a family that loved fireworks, and be sometime between June 28 to July 4th, we would accumulate hundreds, and that's not an exaggeration, of fireworks. And when it came to be the fourth, we would gather our friends together, our families together. We'd laugh and connect and, of course, uh, blow up fireworks. This was a huge highlight in my childhood. The American flag would be flying in the front yard, and uh, we would be um, uh, around the barbecue and, and uh, uh, having a, a fun time on the 4th of July. My brother and I would take turns uh, lighting off the, the fireworks, the mortars, the whistling peats, the crackle balls, the ground bloom. Some of you are nodding like, yeah, this is, this is a, you're speaking my language here. All right. But we would do this late in the night, all in the name of freedom. We'd have a good time. Now, freedom is something, of course, that was fought for. And it's something that, that is, is worked at and continues to be fought for. And freedom in the United States of America gives us the right to pursue the American dream, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. But the challenge is that some of us abuse that freedom. We use that freedom to harm others, to oppress others, or even to, to, to damage our own lives. Now, of course, Independence Day, historically, it is all about being freed from the tyranny of England in the 1700s and 1776, declaring the uh, colonies as being independent states, no longer being ruled by a country far away, but being a nation with a government of the people, by the people, and what? And for the people. You know this. Yes. Freedom. It's, it's, it's an important word to Americans. And the opposite of freedom would be slavery or bondage. 
It's all about being bound and restricted. And I, I want to submit to you today that true freedom for the believer in Christ is being able to live out fully your God-given potential as a child of God made in his image. True freedom is all about being able to fully live out your God-given potential as a child of God made in his image. Freedom has been fought for in this country and fought to be maintained, but unfortunately more and more we see freedoms being eroded, we see government working more and more for the control of, of citizens, we see politicians controlled by business and money. Not the ideal. Freedom is something that needs to constantly be worked at, and we might not realize it, but just one generation ago, ago there was an important segment of our population which didn't have freedom but was segregated. It took a while for people of color, for blacks, to be able to vote. Prior to that, it took a long time for women to be able to vote. It took a lot of time and a fight for workers to be protective from, protected from oppressive businesses. Freedom is important to us. But while we live in the land of the free, often what that means is that it's all about me. That we sometimes define freedom as being left alone to do whatever we want. And that's definitely what we see in our culture today. But to those of us who believe in God and his word, freedom is very important. God has given each and every one of us freedom. Do we believe that? He's given us a free will. He's given us the power to choose. He's given us the freedom to operate in our, in our own power, to, to live by our own conscience, and to live and trust in the power of God. But freedom is also risky. Adam and Eve, of course, had freedom given to them in the Garden of Eden. And uh, for a while, they enjoyed that freedom and in that relationship with God. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says that where the, the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And they were experiencing that freedom. But, of course, they used that freedom to chart their own, own course and were experiencing the effects of rebellion and sin in our lives today. When it comes to freedom and God, there's really two main thoughts when it comes to understanding God, when it comes to, to, to all of this. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with, uh, with a story, something that happened to me not too long ago. I was at a family gathering, and there was a lady who was a friend of the family, and she, she cornered me. Do you ever have family members or friends who, who corner you, and they just they, they want to drill you? I don't know if that happens to you, but um, in that moment, I was cornered, and she said, now, Nate, I know that you're a pastor. Are you an A or are you a C? I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? I don't know what this means. And she said, do you believe in Arminianism or do you believe in Calvinism? And Calvin, I'm not talking about you. Uh, but these are two theological thoughts that have been around for a long time. Now, Jacobus Arminius was a reformer, and John Calvin was a reformer. These are people who, um, during the time of the Reformation, studied theology, studied the Bible, and um, promoted and taught theology, doctrine, based upon what they understood uh, from the Scriptures and what they understood God to be. Now, when it comes to John Calvin, and here's how it relates to freedom. John Calvin, he, he taught many things, but one of the things that he taught was that the fundamental uh, characteristic of God is that he is one of control. Not in the sense that he has everything under his providence and care, but that he is literally controlling all of our lives. And that when we make a decision, really it's, it's not a matter of exercising our own free will, but it's because that has been decided from the beginning of time that, that you were going to make that choice and you were going to make that choice. That, that, um, the, the, the philosophical term is determinism, that everything is determined for us. And Calvin also believes that there are people who 
were born to ultimately be saved and people who were born to ultimately be condemned and that, that God has designed it that way. Now, Arminius believes that we all have free will, that we all get to choose how we respond to the grace of God. We get to choose to live for him or choose to not live for him. And that our ultimate um, destiny is determined by what we choose. Somebody can choose to live for Jesus. Somebody can choose to accept him into their heart, but then go and live a, a life that is totally contrary to the gospel and God's ways, and ultimately would face a, a reality that God doesn't want for any of us. And then there are those who could accept Jesus into their heart and live for him and trust in him. Arminius taught all about free will and uh, that freedom that we have. And the Seventh-day Adventist church typically falls in line with Arminianism. Now, those are some big theological terms. You're not going to have a test. But basically, the concept is either God's controlling and manipulating everything in, in our lives, or God has given us freedom and free will and has given us the opportunity to choose. And we see very clearly in the garden that God has given free will to his creatures. We know what Adam and Eve did with that freedom. But here's the thing. We are free to do whatever we may desire. We are, but we're not free from the consequences of that. We're not free from the moral degradation that, that choosing wrong would do in our lives. We're not free from the effects of choosing sin or wickedness. We live in a world of cause and effect, of natural law. It's how God created this world, the reality that we're in. And for many, in the pursuit of pleasure and using their freedom to pursue pleasure, they find their lives without any meaning. I remember experiencing this in, 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 in my uh, life before uh, being a Christian. I I lived a life that was really concerned only about myself and, and, and about getting what I wanted. And I found that it was a life without meaning. Jesus in Luke chapter 4, he um, is in the synagogue and he opens up the scroll of Isaiah. And it's in our English translations, it would be Isaiah chapter 61. And he reads what his mission is to be all about. Let me give you the right verses for that um, passage. It's Luke chapter 4. And it's verses 18 to 19. So Jesus opens up this scroll and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is Jesus showing up in the synagogue and saying, this is what my life, this is what my ministry, this is what my mission is all about. And it's all about bringing freedom to others, to freeing them from sin. Now, true freedom, again, is being able to live out our God-given potential as a child of God made in his image. And Jesus went about connecting with people and helping them realize who they were in him. And he changed lives. Now, each and every one of us can, can make choices. We can develop habits and addictions and perspectives and attitudes and biases which, which ultimately handcuff us and keep us in slavery and bondage to sin and darkness. Sometimes we have a hard time saying no to things. Can I say no to a batch of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies? Have you ever really tried to exercise your, your will and your restraint when you have something you really love before you, when you're, when you're maybe being very conscious about your calorie intake. Maybe it's possible to be in bondage to cookies. I don't know. But the point is there are temptations and things in our lives that can come about of a more serious nature than cookies that can keep us as 
slaves bound to the object of our desire. In second, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, Paul, the apostle, says this. He says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. So he's saying, in Christ, I have the freedom, the free will to choose anything. I can do anything, but I'm not going to be mastered by anything because I have one master, and that is Jesus. And so the purpose of Jesus coming into this world, as he says in Luke 4, is to liberate us from the, the slavery of sin, the bondage that we're in, the slavery of Satan. And we look, when we look at Jesus and we pay attention to what he has done for us, we can see that God in Jesus Christ has liberated us in all the areas of our life and gives us an invitation, gives us an invitation when we're under that burden. In, in, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We talked about rest a little bit in Sabbath school this morning. But in Jesus, he's saying we have true freedom. Now, I want to submit to you today three things. There are many, many more, but just three things which God wants to free us from so that we can experience true freedom in him. And again, true freedom is being able to live out fully your God-given potential as a child of God made in his image. The first thing, one of the things that, that, that Jesus frees us from is he frees us from performance or self-centered religion or even traditions. Now, I've heard story after story after story of people who are on their deathbeds, but they don't have peace because they're worried about the fact that they did not do enough in their lives. They didn't do all the right things in their lives. And what they're doing is they're not putting their hope in Jesus, the Redeemer, they're putting their hope and trust in the things that they have done. And when they look at the things that they have done, they're not measuring up. And so they get very stressed out and they're without peace. And whenever, by the way, we look at what we have done, whether it's good or bad, we're never going to measure up. We're never going to measure up to, to God's standard. But we can still walk in him. We can still receive of Jesus. And in Galatians 2.16, Paul says, We know that a person is not justified by works of the law through faith in Jesus Christ, so we've also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one will be justified. Of course, throughout the book of Scripture, we see that clarified that that doesn't mean that we do away with the law, that doesn't mean that we live our lives willy-nilly, but in Jesus and Paul's day, the traditions of man departed from the word of God and became burdensome. They became rules that, that, that were lived out with a hardened heart. And today we don't have any problem with traditions or rules or, or hard hearts, right? If only. We can be trapped in performance. We can be trapped and focused on keeping up appearances and proving ourselves to others and to God when that really is, is not the gospel. Galatians 3 says, starting in verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Christ Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, Paul is saying, stop looking at yourselves. Stop trying to pr prove yourselves and just trust in God and let him work through you. And God sees us in, in bondage to focusing in on what we achieve and wants us to be freed into focusing in on what we receive in Jesus. He wants us to receive all those spiritual blessings in Jesus. And so God gives us freedom from tradition and performance, but what else? And this 
we'll, we'll balance things out if you're concerned. God gives this freedom, of course, from the bondage of sin. Now, the Revolutionary War happened because the colonies were suffering under English tyranny, and there was a cost to our freedom, and the liberation came about through, of course, that, that conflict, that war, and then the Declaration of Independence. But the war for our souls was won through a great battle that culminated on the cross at Calvary. When Jesus, who had come into this world, who had descended, who had become a human, who had become a servant, he went and he died a criminal's death so that we could look to him and live and trust in the merits of his righteousness and his goodness and believe and know that our salvation was provided through him. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, a ransom, just like re redemption, has to do with buying one back from, from slavery, from bondage, and, and, and Jesus came to do that. Ransom is something that pays for someone's freedom. Now, I hear often patriots saying that freedom isn't free, that there's a cost to freedom, and there is a cost to our freedom, to our salvation. It was a costly thing. Though it is free to us, it costs so much to God. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And of course, 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we have all sinned, we all need someone to ransom us. We all need a liberator. Galatians 5.1, it says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. That, of course, takes many forms, and, and we've talked about that already. But God is saying, Paul is saying, and God in his scriptures is saying to us that we have been given freedom in Jesus don't use our freedoms to, freedom to then put ourselves under bondage, bondage to sin. Jesus has given us freedom from sin. Not only forgiveness of our sins, but freedom to not sin in his power. Now, this doesn't mean that we will never sin again. I wish it did. But it does mean we're set free from the love of sin, Sin is a fact of life. It's a reality that we live in, but it doesn't have to be a way of life. We don't have to give in to it. We've been set free from that way of life in Jesus. And so again, true freedom is being able to fully live out your God-given potential as a child of God made in his image. And I want to share with you now the final uh, point, the final thing that, that Jesus frees us from. He frees us from Fear. Have you ever been afraid of something? Maybe you were afraid of something as a child, and then growing up you realize that, that uh, you really didn't have anything to be afraid of, or that thing that you were afraid of wasn't all that big of a deal. But unfortunately, adulthood doesn't mean that we are free of, of fears, right? There are things that we worry ourselves over. I know a, a woman who is so afraid of what people think of her that she becomes an entirely dis different person when she's around other people. She puts on a performance, a mask, so that she is pretending to be someone that other people will like. And she's in bondage to, to that fear of others. We can be fearful of what other people think of us. We can be fearful of the future. We can be fearful of just uncertainty or of safety or of finances or of failure or of a pandemic. We can be fearful of loneliness or losing control. We can be fearful of rejection or even commitment. But Romans 8.15 says, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. Can you all say adoption? Adoption. We've all received this spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, 
Abba, Father. In other words, we, we are calling out to God, our Father, because we are his children. Now, I have a, a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law who have really inspired me lately and have just blown me away by their, their kindness and love. Um, my brother-in-law, his name is Steve, he is actually the pastor down at Milo uh, Academy um, down in Days Creek, Oregon. And uh, Milo is a, a boarding school uh, where students from grades 9 through 12 will, will stay there and um, experience their high school days there. And um, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, they, they met a, a young lady by the name of Kale. And uh, Kale had a, a challenging upbringing where she was overlooked often. She was neglected. Um, she just doesn't have a, a strong connection to her family. But they, in, in, um, in well, for, for some reason, they sent her along to, to Milo. And there are lots of, of children and students who end up at boarding academies and, and who, have, who have lived challenging lives. But Steve and Allison, my brother and sister-in-law, decided to take her under their wing. And it's one thing to be a mentor to someone. It's one thing to pray for them. And it's one thing to kind of coach them along. But it's an entirely different thing to call them family. And what they have done is they have informally, at least at this point, adopted this young lady. And they've said, you are now family to us. You're going to be with us during the holidays. We're going to help you get to college we're going to um, invite you into our home. You're going to be a sister to our sons. We're going to call you our daughter. And it has completely changed her life. And she's now calling them mom and dad. And we, we now have a, a, another niece in our lives because they've decided that they are going to, to love this girl to the point where she was and is a family member. It's such an incredible story, and, and she's, she's so much fun, this young lady. And she's going to be starting school at Walla Walla University um, in the fall. But they have said to her, essentially, you belong. And when we know that, that God says that to us, that he has adopted us, he has said, regardless of what your struggles are, what you're dealing with, what you're fearful of, you belong to me. When we accept that, when we internalize that, it, it changes everything. And we don't need to, to fear because we can be secure in our identity as children of God. We can know that he is our father. We can know that he calls us his, his child. And we can know that we are truly free in Jesus. Recently, I read a beautiful statement from Pastor Mark Wittes. He is the pastor over at Sunnyside Church um, in uh, uh, northeast Portland. And he was talking about freedom. And he says, Freedom frees me from other people's opinions and expectations of me because I'm already accepted. It frees me to do anything I want, when I want, and how I want, because now I want what, God, what makes God smile. It frees me to love my enemies and pray for those who persecute me. It frees me from the need to judge or condemn others. My faith frees me to include everyone who would a seat at my table. I don't have to fear death or life. I can just live every day in the freedom of God's love and acceptance. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus says to us, if the Son sets you free, in John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And perhaps today you're longing for that type of freedom, that freedom in your heart, that peace. But maybe you're crippled by being bound to dry, self-centered religion. Maybe you're crippled by being bound to sin or, or some habit or some attitude that's, that's, that's keeping you down. Maybe you're crippled by fear. But I want you to know today that in Jesus you have every spiritual blessing. He has given, given you freedom. He's given you life. 
And fear can be crippling. But freedom changes everything. 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. And Proverbs 1.33 says, Whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. And so if we, if we know who God is and know who we are in him, we're going to be at peace. We're going to be free and secure in him. Fear is what comes when our peace isn't in God. Of course, Isaiah says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I want to close out now and truly close out because I know I say, you know, it's a pastor thing to say, I'm, I'm going to close and then go on forever. I'm not going to do that to you today. I want to give you some freedom in your afternoon. But in, in 1 John 4, 18, we're reminded that it says, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. I want you to know today that you're loved by God and that you have freedom in Jesus. And I hope that you would accept that today, that you'd find confidence in the one who came to secure our freedom, freedom from tradition, freedom from sin, freedom from fear, and know that he has come and lived and died for us so that we would have freedom in him, freedom to live out our God-given potential as a child of God made in his image. May that be your blessing today. Let's pray together. Our Lord in heaven, how can we truly thank you for the real freedom that you've given us in Jesus. Lord, as we rise up and leave this place today, may we do so in security in you. And so, Lord, I want to pray right now, if there is anyone in this room who's crippled by fear or sin or performance, that you would just break those chains right now and help them to rest in the salvation and freedom which you have given to us. Lord, meet us all in the place of our need, the place where we need to be freed. And Lord, help us to accept what you've given, to, given us today. Lord, as our nation celebrates Independence Day, Lord, help us to also take a moment to remember the freedom you've given us in Jesus. We love you, we praise you, we worship you, we give you all the glory, and we now go to walk in you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, my friends and family. Have a great Sabbath and a great Fourth of July weekend.